Hello and welcome to this live webinar from Fidelity on how to be a good investor. I'm Ed Monk and I'm joined by Fidelity Investment Director Tom Stevenson to take a look at some of the principles and the rules of thumb that all investors should have an understanding of when they risk their money in the investment markets and which we believe can improve your chances of success in the long term. We are live today, which gives us the chance to invite you to submit questions to the two of us and we'll do our best to answer them towards the end of our discussion. We have already gathered some of those questions in advance. I will say at the outset that what you'll hear today is not personalised financial advice in any way. It is just guidance. That said, Tom, um, let's frame our conversation today a little bit. Um, we're going to be focusing, aren't we, on some recent work that we've produced here at Fidelity, which pulls together some guiding principles on how to be a good investor. Now, um, it's going to be particularly useful for novice investors and perhaps those who aren't very confident yet in their investing, but we'd hope that they do have some value uh, and may be acting as a refresher for all investors. Yeah, I'm sure they will, Ed. I mean, we, we talk about investing principles um, quite a lot. And I think when we did this work, we created this, this part of the website. We just wanted to sort of gather it all together in, in one place. And hopefully that will be useful for, for all investors. I mean, obviously, for people who are just starting out, it's good to have these principles in mind uh, when they start their investing journey. But I think really for, for, for everyone, they don't change as you go through your investing life. Yeah. They are, that's the nature of principles. They, they are, they're good for, for, for life, really. And they can be easy to forget. So it's often useful to always, be Always good to be reminded. Yeah. Indeed. Okay, okay. Well, um, now, if anyone wants to read about those principles in more detail, they can find them on the fidelity.co.uk website. We'll show the charts uh, pertaining to that on screen, so you will be able to see them. And we'll do our best to talk over those without making this too much of a mass lecture. Um, but let's get going then, shall we, on the first principle that we're going to talk about today. And that is the principle, it's a fairly simple one, of starting as early as you can when it comes to investing and the power of simply giving your investments time. So. Yeah, I mean, it is a simple one, and but it's probably the most important principle of all. I mean, time is such a powerful uh, force when it comes to, to, to investment. The longer that you are uh, invested in the markets, the longer you have uh, to allow uh, the markets to, to, to work in your favour. So, you know, the best way that you can do that, obviously, is to, is to start as early as you can in your life. Yeah, indeed. And so hopefully if we can bring up the first chart. Um, so what we have here, Tom, is... Uh, a chart showing a couple of investors. We've got lines representing um, two uh, two investors. Both have contributed a thousand pounds a year to their investments, but crucially, one starts ten years before the other one, and that extra bit of time leads to a big difference, doesn't it, in terms of their outcomes? Even though the amounts that they put in overall are the same. Yeah, and, and obviously this is a kind of oversimplification uh, uh, of of the of the situation for, for these two investors, but um, it's a it's it's a very simple principle uh, that uh, the earlier you start, you get those extra years. Um, while as the first investor, you get the extra years before the other investor starts. Everything else is exactly the same. They make the same contributions. They get the same return. Um, but what you can see from the chart is that the returns that they achieve actually sort of diverge. And the, the second investor, the one that left it for 10 years, is never going to catch up with the first one. Yeah. Even if, and this is, and we built this into our model, even if the first investor actually stops making a contribution after, I think it's 30 years, 30 of the 40 years, they actually stopped putting money in. Yeah. But still, the other investor will never catch up with them. So it's all about the power of just getting started. And you can see at the end of that chart, the difference is sizable. And as you say, it's growing. And thinking a little bit how this might be put into practice, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Start as early as you can to give your investments time to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And when you start investing, it may well be that, you know, you can't invest a huge amount um, because, you know, you're not earning very much or, you yeah. know, you've got other things, uh, other calls on your money. But just getting started is is the most important thing because, you know, you can't get those years back. Once they've gone, they've gone. And, you, and all of a sudden, you become that second investor who's never going to catch up. Yeah. And, and it's particularly relevant, I would say, for retirement savings because people are locking away money there potentially for decades and decades and decades. That's when a chart like that is really powerful because 
starting at 25 makes a big difference from starting at 35 or 45. Yeah, and and you know, and, and if you don't start at 25, you know, you get to 35, and suddenly when you're 35, you really do have lots of other calls on your money. You know, you might have children. Um, yeah. You know, you might be uh, looking to to buy a house, and the, all of a sudden there are lots of reasons why you might not want to invest. So if you get into that habit early on, then you're more likely to keep it going. Okay. Well, um, let's move on if we can to um, another chart to make a point around. Um, time uh, spent in the market and, and how powerful that can be. If we can bring that one up. Okay, so this one does take a little bit more explaining, but it shows you the range of returns that you will have got by investing in shares. This is the S&P 500, the American stock market, uh, that you would have got over 5, 10, and 20 years. You can see on the left, the range of returns, of annualized returns, if you had invested for just one year, are really wide. You might have got a 60% gain over one year, you might have had a 40% loss over one year. The point is, as you move rightwards across that chart, if you leave your money invested for longer periods, for five, for 10, for 20 years, um, the range of returns that you're going to get narrows right down, doesn't it? And importantly, the chance of you making some kind of positive return greatly increases, doesn't it? Yeah, so this is a this is a, an interesting chart, and it and it does require a little bit of sort of getting your head around. But once you understand it, it's really powerful. Because so what it what it says is that 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 stock markets shares can be pretty volatile in the short term. So you know over a one year period, historically there have been there's been a very wide dispersion of returns. Some years fantastic returns plus sixty yeah. percent. Some years very poor returns minus forty percent, and and everything in between. As time goes by, and the longer that you invest, so 5, 10, 20 years, that, that range actually narrows. So that's the first point, that, yeah. that it becomes more predictable what your returns are going to be. But the second point is equally important, in fact, probably more important, is that the, the range actually moves up, up yeah. the chart so that um, the, the chance of you getting a positive return if you invest for a longer period rises. Um, and so, you know, there is a point um, beyond which there has never been a period in which you've had a negative return, and it's 18 or 20 years, something like yeah. that. Um, uh, but so what it's saying is that the longer you can do it for, the more certain you can be. And there are no guarantees in investment. We should probably make that point. Yeah. But the more certain that you can be that you will get uh, a positive return. And in terms of putting this principle into practice, I suppose the thing to say is... Um, Look, you know, try and give your, your money as much time as you can to, to grow, but have an idea of your timelines. Are you investing for 5, 20, 5, 10, 20 years if, if you can? Because mm. um, then you can begin to build plans and assumptions and expectations around you getting a positive return. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and, and I suppose at the extremes, you know, if you are, if you are, let's say you need your money in a year's time um, because you want to put down a deposit on a house or, or Whatever, whatever the reason is, you have to accept that the, the historical record is very wide and you might get lucky and have mm -hmm. that very high return. You might also get unlucky and have that very low return. So you need, to, you need to factor in the time horizon when you're thinking about your investments as well. Okay, well, let's move on, Tom, to the next principle that we're going to talk about, um, which is to invest Regularly, one of the questions that we're asked, uh, pro probably more than any other, um, is whether someone should make their investments in a mm. one go, in a lump sum, or whether they should phase it over time and in stages. And we've got a couple of charts that can show the difference that it can make. So the, the first of these, uh, which we hope people can see on screen, it shows uh, two lines representing two different investors. Both of them have a total of £12,000 to invest. One does it all in one go, and one does it in stages of a thousand pounds a month for a year. What you can see here is what would have happened to their, the value of their investments in a market that was broadly flat, although it fell at first and then recovered. Mm -hmm. What's it telling us? Yeah, so there are a number of different scenarios, uh, obviously, and this is just one. This is mm -hmm. one scenario. So, so as you as you describe it, the the the, the market actually ends up where it started at the end, but in between, it, it, it fell. So, so the investor that put all of their money in at the start, obviously, by definition, ended up with the same amount at, at the end. Yeah. However, the investor that, that dripped their money in um, uh, over, the, over the period of time uh, in 12 increments, 
um, benefited from the fact that at certain points on that journey, because the market fell and then, then recovered, at certain points, they were buying more units with the same amount of money. Yeah. And so therefore, where they ended up was actually ahead of the investor who just put their money uh, in uh, at the time. So there are certain circumstances in which regular saving can actually benefit you financially as well. And that kind of market return would be one of those scenarios. But if we can move on to the next chart, we can look at uh, a similar scenario, but a different market sort of um, scenario mm. where this time the market has been steadily rising in the, over the period. Mm. And under those circumstances, it's obviously better to have as much exposure as you can for as long as you can. And so you can see on the chart, the, the uh, investor putting all their money in, in one go, ends up with a higher return this time. Yeah, and, and that's kind of intuitive, isn't it? I mean, you know, if the market, if the market is rising, steadily, which, which is what's illustrated by, by this chart, then by definition, you want to get your money working as early as possible to benefit from, from, from that rise. And, and the investor that drips their money in um, is actually going to be getting slightly fewer uh, units with each subsequent investment that they make because the price has gone up a, yeah. a little bit. So they would have been better off investing at the start. So I guess the point is that, you know, there are many different possible scenarios. Yeah, but the principle is to invest regularly. And what this shows is that maybe that works for you, maybe it doesn't work for you. That's going to depend on market conditions. But there's an overarching um, point around investing regularly, uh, which, which yeah, you probably and, explain. Yeah, and I think, I think that the point is, uh, the, the, the benefit, the real benefit for me of investing regularly is not whether it actually works out financially or not fi whether it works out financially. It is a point that psychologically, it's actually a really helpful thing to do. Because if you put all your money to work and the market falls, that's a really unsettling place yeah. to be. And you might actually stop investing when that happens. If you're putting your money in regularly, then it becomes a discipline, it becomes, you take the emotion out of it. So I think for me, that's the real benefit. Of and, and if you regularly. think, you know, back to those charts, the, the, the scenario in which um, you would have been better off having all your money in right from the start because the market has risen. Um, if you had been phasing your investments, you're going to end up with lower, a lower amount than you potentially could have had. However, you'll still have a positive return. Exactly. And, and so, that's okay. It might not be optimal, but it's still a good outcome. Yeah. What you're protecting yourself against when you invest regularly is the other scenario when, as you say, you potentially stand to lose value quickly. It's a harder experience. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, it's not symmetrical. I, I mean, actually, I think that the benefits are greater than the than, than the downside. And of course, when it comes to investing regularly. That's an easy one to put into practice. There's all sorts of mechanisms that you can use, regular saving plans. Yeah. That can be done for uh, as, as cheaply as £25 a month, yeah. I think, yeah. to um, start one of those. Okay, um, we are going to move on now to our next principle. And this one uh, covers a lot of ground. It is the principle of managing your risk and to be comfortable with the risks that you're taking. Um, it is a really broad area. There are many different types of risks at play when you invest your money, Tom. Um, we're gonna take a look at a few of them. Uh, if, we get, if we can have the first of these graphics on the screen. Tom, why don't you take us through what this is showing? Yeah, so, so I mean, this is, this is just a very simple chart. It covers uh, a, a 20 or so, just over 20 year period. These are, these are actual, actual returns that we're talking about. And it compares, the returns that you that you would would have got over that period for investing in shares and in bonds uh, and in cash, and the broad principle uh, is that um, over that period historically shares have outperformed both bonds uh, and cash. But if you look at the chart, you can see that that hasn't been the case throughout that journey. There have yeah. been there have been moments then when uh, actually shares, because they're more volatile, actually dip below both bonds. Um, and cash. So I think what the chart is saying is that over a long period of time, then um, shares have delivered better returns, but there is a price that you've paid for that. And the price that you've paid is that in the short term, you might get more volatility, you might get a few more sleepless nights yeah. uh, as a consequence. If you're happy to take that, that's fine. If that unsettles you and you prefer um, to have more sleepful nights, <laughs> um, you have to accept that you're probably going to get lower returns. So it's making the point that returns and risk are related. 
And, and it's, a, it's an important one to bear in mind, isn't it? Because, you, you know, if you're invested in, in risk assets, with bonds are risk assets, but equities are riskier risk mm. assets. Um, and that volatility, volatility comes along. You need to bear in mind a chart like that because it, it, it tells you that, as you say, volatility is the cost sometimes of the higher returns that are available on some riskier assets. You need to have an idea of uh, whether that's a sensible risk to take, mm -hmm. but it can make the volatility easier to handle. Yes, and again, I mean, as with the previous uh, principle, um, a lot of this is actually a psychological thing. It's 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 being at ease with the, with the level of risk that you're prepared to take, but also just understanding that your natural inclination to avoid risk is maybe not helpful because to to get the really acceptable, decent returns over the long period, maybe you need to force yourself to take a. a a sensible level of risk. And I think this is this is the crucial point about risk. It's taking the right risk. It's not taking silly risks, risks yeah. that you don't understand. It's understanding the risks that you're taking. Okay, well, let's um, move on to another chart that shows uh, or makes a point about uh, risk in, event, in investments. Okay, it's an incredibly busy and complicated looking chart, Tom. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, it, it's showing the risk of, of overexposure to to one asset or one area of the market. Um, there's an answer to that and to mitigating that, and that it is, is of course, to diversify your investments. Um, why don't you talk us a little bit through this chart and what it's showing us? Yeah, I mean, let, let's just explain what, what, what's going on with this chart. So, so e each of those little cells represents the, the performance of a particular asset. So that might be shares or, or bonds or cash or commodities, property, any number of things, different things that people can invest in. And each of the vertical uh, lines is a, is a year. So you can see that in any given year, the top performing asset is different from what it was in the previous year, yeah. or it may actually sometimes be the same as in the previous year. But the point is that it's completely unpredictable what it's going to be, and it moves around a lot. Yeah. Um, so you don't know what's going to happen um, uh, in advance. And the way to mitigate that risk that you will end up in the wrong asset class is to have a well diversified, well balanced portfolio. That means that the blended performance of all your different assets will probably bounce along in the middle and fluctuate much less. It, it will be a much smoother ride um, and um, you won't get the extreme positive performances, yeah. you also won't get the extreme negative ones. Yeah. So that's the benefit of diversification. And, and the point of a chart like that is the scattergun, mm. apparently random nature of yeah. it. That's telling you something. It's telling you that um, the, the, the best performing, the worst performing assets aren't really very predictable. Um, so as you say, diversify to mitigate that risk. Yeah, because if it was predictable, I mean, you could say, well, you know, if, if, if every year the, the, the the assets which performed badly last year did well this year. That would be fantastic because then you could then you could arrange your investments according to that. Trouble is, sometimes that's the case, and sometimes it's not the case, and you simply don't know in advance. No one does. Okay, so all very well in theory. How do you put it into practice? How do you achieve diversification? Well, I mean, how you how you achieve diversification is to invest in a wide range of both asset classes, but also geographical areas, because just as um, shares and bonds and property and cash will move differently uh, over time. So too will different stock markets, for example. So one year the US will do well, another year emerging markets will do well, or Japan or the UK. Yeah. So, uh, and again, it's impossible to predict in advance. So have a nice, balanced, diversified portfolio of all of those. And in terms of achieving it, um, there's lots of help and lots of guidance that people can use. Um, investing in a fund actually is a good way to get diversification, but that fund might be in one particular area of the market, but some funds will invest globally. So across all sorts of uh, geographical regions, there's all sorts of ways of doing it. Um, and at the most basic level, you could there's options. We have uh, the Navigator range of funds, which just lets you choose uh, a range of assets based on your attitude to risk. Mm -hmm. We've got the Select 50 as well, which is uh, already narrowing down thousands of funds into a, a list of just 50, which we believe are well placed to operate well in their area of the market as well. So achieving that diversification isn't as difficult as perhaps it first seems when you're encountered with thousands of funds. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, you know, basically you, you look at a, an, an investment um, platform like, like our own and, and we might have 
I don't know, 3,000 funds on, on that platform. And, and as an investor, you might look at 3,000 funds and think, I haven't got the foggiest idea where, where to start here. I just yeah. simply don't know what, what to do with all, with all these funds. So a lot of the work that we do actually is to help people navigate that um, set of 3,000 funds. Um, and, and you mentioned the, the Select 50, that's, that's one of the, the tools that, that we use. Um, you know, I'd say it's probably our flagship tool actually, because these are the 50 funds out of those 3,000 funds, which we really like. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, you know, we've, we've done the analysis and, and then we've done all the back testing and the, 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 the due diligence. Um, and we really like these funds. And I think many people find that really helpful because that's a, that's a much more manageable starting point. 50 funds, which we really like, rather than 3,000 funds about which you know very little. Okay, okay, well, let's move on to the last graphic in this section for this principle. Um, Tom, and if we can bring that on screen. Here we go. Um, okay, so this one is very topical uh, <laughs> because of what's going on in the economy right now. Uh, it shows us the risk of inflation. And why don't you explain what we can see here, Tom? Yeah, so I mean, this is this is a very uh, simple concept, but it's a concept which we've probably um, uh, allowed ourselves to forget about uh, in recent years because inflation has not really been been an issue. But uh, you know, if you've been around as long as I have, you'll you'll have lived through years when inflation was was a very serious uh, problem. And 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 what inflation, of course, does is that it, it erodes your purchasing power. And we've illustrated this on this chart with with the, the sort of uh, the, the simple idea of a shopping basket, which, uh, you know, this chart is showing a, a shopping basket of £60 or so, and just saying that at different inflation rates over a period of time, the cost of that shopping basket is going to rise um, uh, yeah. significantly. And, and I think what I take away from this chart is that the, the, the inflation rates that we're talking about are pretty modest, actually. Mm. I mean, the, the biggest inflation rate on this chart is 6%, I think. And, 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 and at 6% over this period of um, time, you know, the, 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 the purchasing power of your money it, it falls by a quarter. Yeah. In other words, what you buy is going to cost you four times as much at the end of the period uh, at the beginning. There's this thing called the rule of 72, which allows you to calculate just how much uh, the, the, the eroding power of, uh, of inflation can be. So divide the inflation rate into 72. So that 6% uh, inflation rate, divide 6 into 72, that gives you 12. What that tells you is that within 12 years, the value of your money, the purchasing power of your money is going to halve mm -hmm. in just 12 years at 6%. So it really shows that they sometimes inflation is described as an invisible tax because that's yeah. exactly what it is. <clears throat> your money, someone's taken three quarters of your money away, and, but, but you haven't noticed. It's just happened, mm. you know, on the sly, if you like. Um, inflation is a really insidious factor. And for investors, and especially for people moving into retirement and hopefully enjoying a, a long retirement, yeah. inflation can, can really be very damaging over a very long retirement. So you need to really think about how you're going to mitigate th that impact um, throughout your retirement. Yeah, and, that, and that's about um, setting goals and expectations which factor that in to say yeah. that, you know, th there's a certain amount of progress you need to make to stand still. Yeah. As those, those graphics show, you need yeah. more money to buy the same things. Um, but, uh, and it's, it's a reminder that you might need to take the risk, we've been talking about risk, that you need to take that extra risk to, to, to get ahead of inflation. It's not enough for you to sort of um, stash your money in cash onto the mattress because you will in fact be going backwards yeah. if you do that. Yeah, because if you think about the inflation rate as, as that, that's, that's the baseline, that's standing still. You know, If inflation is running at 5% a year, then you need to earn 5% a year just to keep your head above water. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all very well saying, oh, well, you know, I've got my, my, my goal is I'm going to save, I'm going to save 500,000 pounds for my pension pot. That's great unless that 500,000 pounds because of inflation is suddenly worth 250,000 pounds. So yeah. yeah, keep it in mind. Okay, so let's um, talk, let's move on, shall we, to the final of the principles that we're gonna talk about today, uh, which is to do all of your investing, if you possibly can, uh, in as tax efficient way as you possibly can. Um, that can mean a few different things, I suppose, but at the heart, it means avoiding giving up returns, which are pretty hard to come by anyway, don't give those up to tax if you can avoid that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I described uh, inflation as an invisible tax, but of course, there are some very visible <laughs> taxes that, uh, uh, that are completely uh, explicit, income taxes, capital gains taxes. Um, and, you know, the good news is that there are, there are many ways in which you can, you know, quite legally, um, quite ethically avoid paying, paying those, those, those taxes. Um, but you absolutely want to do that as much as, uh, as possible because, you know, just like inflation erodes the purchasing power of your money, giving money to the government also erodes the purchasing power of your money. Yeah, and if we can bring up a, a chart to show um, some of the effects of this. This is fairly straightforward, I hope. Um, it shows what would have happened if you had invested the maximum allowed in ISAs. ISAs, of course, being a tax efficient way to invest your money. Um, Every year since the inception of ISIS, I think back in 1999, um, you can see the value of contributions rising uh, with the orange line. Um, but the blue line above that shows you what you would have had from investing that money over, over time. And I suppose the point of a chart like this, Tom, is that by the time you get to the, 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 the right hand side of that chart, you've got a big chunk there in blue. That's all, that's all money that's held in a tax efficient, tax free, wrapper, you can take income from that ISA tax-free. Um, it can be a very, very significant uh, thing to have over long periods of time. Yeah, so I guess what this, this chart is actually making a few different points at the same time. I mean, one, it, it, it's showing that, you know, the stepped orange line is, is the, the amount of money that you put in. And as you rightly said, the blue, the blue bit in the middle is your, uh, it represents the returns that you've made over and above the money that you've actually put in. But the key point which you also made is that, that, that those returns are now tax free. And the beauty of, a, of an ISA actually is you don't even need to tell the tax man about an ISA. You know, yeah. it is, you know, and that's that's fantastic. You know, it's, there's not even there's not even an administrative headache when it comes to an ISA. All that money that you that you accumulate in an ISA is is just yours, tax free. Yeah, and of course, not the only way to to invest tax efficiently. Uh, pensions would be the other mainstream way of of investing tax efficiently, uh, tax efficiently. And I guess that's just a reminder that um, if you are saving for the long term and for your retirement, and bear in mind you can get access to pension money from age 55, rising to 57 in a couple of years, but um, do, do that as well. Take advantage of the pensions tax relief mm. that is available where uh, your, your contributions are effectively pre-tax. Um, that's a really valuable addition, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we probably haven't got time here to sort of go into all the details of how a, a, a pension is different for, from an ISA. But, you know, one, you get your tax relief up front and one, you get it at, at, the, at you know, at effectively yeah. at the back end. So, so the, 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 the tax benefit is structured in a slightly different way. But both of them have very generous um, allowances. It's a very significant um, tax advantage, which everyone should take advantage of to the extent that, that they can. And also the other thing about pensions, of course, let's not forget that um, you know, very often, especially in a workplace uh, situation, you're likely to get contributions from the employer. So um, yeah. you know, it, it's not only tax efficient, it's also beneficial in other ways. Okay, okay, well, okay, that is the end of our run through of our investing principles. Now I said at the start that we'll be able to take questions as well. So we've left a good amount of time to do that. And so Tom, let's get into those now, shall we? Um, and we'll get through as many as we can yep. before they tell me we should stop. <laughs> um, so the first question is this, it's very topical. It says, with interest rates around 6% for fixed term savings, that's cash savings, I suppose, over two years, um, is it wiser to save risk-free in cash rather than invest in shares and bonds? It's a big question. It's a big question and there isn't really a simple answer. But I mean, the, 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 the fantastic situation that we now find ourselves in is that we at least have a choice now. Yeah. Um, and, and until very recently, until interest rates rose to the levels which were described in the question, uh, we really didn't have a choice because you, know, you could not earn very much money on, on risk-free uh, investment. So if you wanted to have the security of um, knowing that you would keep hold of your capital, then the price that you paid was accepting a very low yeah. return. That's not the case now. So you can you you can invest um, in cash or or cash like uh, investments. So uh, for example, on our Select Fifty, which we talked about earlier, um, we have a money market fund now, sometimes called a money market fund, sometimes called a cash fund. 
Um, and we have a few actually on, on the platform. Um, I th there's a Fidelity one, there's a Legal in General, uh, a Royal, Royal London, London, a BlackRock. Yeah. There, are, there are a few of these, these cash funds and they're paying very decent returns. And they're not, while they're not completely risk-free, um, the risks are negligible. Yeah. So you're, you're able to, to, get, to strike that balance. So that's the reason to do it. Of course, the reason not to do it is one of the reasons why interest rates are high, of course, is because inflation is high. Yeah. So even if you're earning 5% on your money in a, in a money market fund, all you're doing is keeping pace with, with, with inflation. And just harking back to that earlier chart we saw where we had the divergence of different asset classes, shares and bonds and, and cash, you know, if you want to not just match inflation, but get ahead of inflation, yeah. maybe you need to take more of a risk uh, as well. So I don't think it's, in answer to the question, I don't think it's a panacea. Yeah. I don't think it's the answer. Uh, it might be part of the answer. Yeah, and, and it's going to come down to what suits each individual, because some people will look at the cash returns on offer and say, well, do you know what? At that level of return, if I can get 5 or 6%, as the, as the question says, on cash, that might be all I need to make all my financial plans work. Mm. And, and it's hard to argue with that. But I, I've been thinking about this question a lot in terms of the last two years of, of what's been happening um, on cash savings, but also in the stock market. Now, probably over the last two years, you would have been better being off, better off being in cash because mm. you'd have got some kind of positive return this year and a much better positive return from cash this, mm. la, this year, if mm. I made that, that makes mm. sense. Um, and that's versus the stock market, say, where big losses last year, a good recovery this year, but you're probably not Back quite where you started, were. Probably, yeah. Yeah. But the reality of people's behaviour is probably not that they were in cash last year. They mm. probably would have lost on the stock market, then thought, oh my God, you know, I want to get back into cash, mm. and then moved into cash. Well, if you look at the stock market this year, that's done much better than cash. Mm. And so you, you need to be careful not to abandon risk assets when they have a dive, because mm. they tend to recover quickly, just as they can fall quickly. Yeah, absolutely, and that's and that and that is another principle which actually we didn't really talk about today. But this idea of spending time in the market rather than trying to time the market, rather than timing the market, yeah. um, really important principle. Because um, well, we did kind of touch on it with when we talked about the different asset classes moving in at different times in different directions. Yeah. It's unpredictable. Uh, and the, the nature of unpredictable markets is that if you're constantly looking over your shoulder in the rear view mirror, then you're going to be behind the curve and you're probably going to end up with a, with a bad outcome. So, you know, setting a strategy that, that then works through the cycle is, is, is a better approach. Okay, great. Let's um, move on to the next question, which is this, Tom. It says, what proportion of funds should make up the ideal portfolio? It goes on, what proportion of cash as well? What is the point of keeping cash here rather than under the bed? Okay, so it's asking a few things there. Let's we'll start with the first one. How many funds do you need in a portfolio? Right, yes. Well, you need, you need enough funds to, to provide the diversification that, that, that we've already talked about. I mean, a fund, it provides an, an element of diversification in and of itself yeah. because it holds you know, a number of individual investments. So, you know, a fund might hold 100 different shares, for example. So there's some diversification there. But those 100 shares might all be invested in the UK stock market. So yeah. you would also then want to have some diversification uh, geographically and also through different asset classes. So there isn't a, there isn't a, an answer, I mean, there isn't a number, you know, it's not like the meaning of life is 42. Uh, you know, the, 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 the answer here is not eight funds yeah you know it could be eight could be it, one it, exactly know. it depends it depends what what the funds are and, and how well diversified those funds themselves are and and, and it does actually open up the, the topic of over diversification diversification mm. is an awful um label that's, that's been made up for this where you have so many different types of funds covering so many different areas of the market that actually um you're just recreating the, mar the market in totality, which of course can be done very, very cheaply through passive funds, yeah. through tracker funds. Yeah. If you're doing that through expensive active funds, there's no point. You need to understand the, the point of where you're, you're pointing your portfolio. Yes, and the other point about diversification, uh, as you put it, is that from an individual uh, portfolio manager's perspective, he or she probably know a great deal about 10 or 20 of their investments. Yeah. They probably know not a great deal about 
numbers 93 and 127 yeah, in, yeah, in their yeah, yeah. portfolio. So just having lots and lots of investments doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting a better outcome if you don't actually know anything about them. Yeah, and, and they have just asked about cash, what proportion to holding cash. That's an interesting question mm. because it's not quite the same as saying, you know, should you turn to cash for a high return? Mm. There's other reasons, good reasons to hold cash. Well, that's the point. Is that The point of the question is, um, uh, or rather the, the, the point of the answer to the question is, well, why am I holding cash? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I might be holding cash now because it's giving me a safe uh, return. And that's, that's a good reason to, to hold cash. But another reason to hold cash is that uh, it acts as, um, if you like, dry powder in your investment portfolio. So we know that the markets go up and down, they're volatile. If the market falls, and you have got some cash ready to deploy, to invest in, in the market, fantastic. You can take advantage of that fall. If you're fully invested and the market falls, then you can't do that. So yeah. it, I think it's always wise to have an, a, a bit of cash in your portfolio, but you have to accept that that cash is not working hard for you. Um, yeah. So don't overdo it. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I mean, it varies from investor to investor, but you know, anything from sort of ten to fifteen percent is probably more than enough of cash. That gives you the dry powder yeah. without tying up too much in a low yielding asset. Yeah, you almost need different. I mean, it's not just across your investments; it, it, all your finances. You need to sort of there. There may be needs for cash in terms of rainy day money. Mm. You know, the money that you, you sort of in a pinch you might have to reach for. And you might want that separated out, but it's entirely personal, isn't it? That might be three months of income or six yeah. months of income, yeah. whatever you're happy with. But it's important to have a figure in mind mm. so that you're not um, stockpiling money in cash and, as you say, mm. uh, not have it work very hard. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, someone who is in, in retirement, who is drawing money down from their portfolio, uh, cash plays a, a different role there completely yeah. because what it does then is it provides a buffer, a kind of cushion against the volatility of the market. That It means that you are not being forced to draw money out of your investments when the market is low because you've got a cash buffer and you can take your money out of there. So that's another um, reason for holding cash that we haven't even discussed until now. Okay, well, we're going to move on, Tom, to our third question, and it is this. How often to rebalance and when to rebalance a portfolio? Right. Um, yes. I mean, you, you, you need to keep an eye on your portfolio, but you don't need to keep too much an eye on, uh, yeah. eye on your portfolio. I think there is a, there is a, there's a risk that people um, um, uh, fixate or sort of hyper focus on their portfolio and they're watching what's going on in the news and they're watching the ups and downs. And I think that probably leads you to make uh, unwise decisions. So set a strategy, revisit the strategy infrequently, let's say once a year. Yeah. Uh, and say, is this still working for me? Um, you know, does it still make sense? Is it is it in line with my aspirations, my risk appetite, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, and just do it like that. Just maybe once a year, I think make, it makes sense. Yeah, it's hard to put an answer on that mm. in a prescriptive way, isn't it? Because if you imagine a portfolio, different asset classes, different types of investments, they're going to be moving in value, and that's going to be taking you away from that original split that you've decided works for you, whether yeah. that's bonds versus shares versus cash or geographical, however you want to do it. Yeah. But you don't want to cut it off too soon because you know we know how investments often behave. There might be a prevailing set of circumstances which mean one asset class, say, is going to do well, and you want to let it do well for a yeah. certain period of time yeah. without your balance of risk getting kind of skewed out of control. Yeah, you make a you make a very good point there that, that that actually you know let's say the stock market does does really well and you know your your strategy was to say I want to have seventy five percent of my portfolio in shares but because the stock market does well it suddenly becomes eighty five percent yeah um, you might want to adjust that back to your seventy five percent target but on the other hand you also another principle of investment is to is to is to run your profit so if yeah. something is doing well then you don't want to Cut it off at the legs while it's still yeah. performing well. So it, it's it's again it's it's a balance, and that's why you shouldn't do it too frequently. Yeah, set a, set a calendar reminder or something yeah. once a year. Yeah, it's, beginning know, of the year, your birthday, whatever it is, and yeah, do it then. Okay, um, we're going to move on, Tom. And the next question is this: Which should I do first, my ISA or my pension? Good question, um, uh, and I think the answer is probably uh, both. <laughs> um, you know there are there are there are benefits to, to doing them, and we've talked we've 
we've talked about uh, some of them. Um, you know, there is they, they do have different different tax treatments, but uh, you know, I think that both of them have generous um, allowances, uh, annual allowances, and you should you should maximise the use of them. And as I said before, there are certain advantages to pensions in, term, in within the workplace environment yeah. that, that you're likely to attract contributions from your employer uh, as well. So I I I, I would not. I would not favour one over the other. I, I would just add, add this really, which is that, you know, we've spoken before about the long term uh, when it comes to, to, to pension savings. Of the two, of an ISA, uh, you know, an ISA you could set up in five minutes mm. now, you know, very, very quickly, easy to do. A pension, there may be, depending on what type of pension, a little bit of legwork and admin to get that done. Maybe it means arranging it through your employer or what have you. Um, I, I would say get that admin for a pension done as soon as you can. I, this is obviously going to be more relevant to younger people, mm. I think. But um, get that established. That's not the same as shoveling lots and lots of money into mm. it. But once it's like all these things, you know, once you've actually done the, the sort of difficult bit at the start, it becomes easy just to kind of ratchet things up as it goes on. Mm. Um, and it is very important not to let that start point for saving into a pension slide too much. As you say, I think the answer about what comes first, ice for a pension, is entirely personal because mm. what's your priority? You could extend this out and say, you know, saving for a house versus pension versus mm. ice. And the reality is all of them are important mm. and all of them have a role to play. But um, yeah, don't leave either of these too long. Yeah. And let's not forget that they're, they're, there's a difference also in terms of their flexibility. So, yeah. you know, you are, you are locked into a yeah. pension until um, uh, well, it was the age of fifty-five, and that is pro- progressively getting uh, getting higher. I think um, with a with a with an ISA, you can you can dip in and out of, of an ISA. So I think if that provides you with a bit of flexibility, that's probably a good thing. Okay, okay, we're going to squeeze in one more before we have to wrap it up today, Tom. And the final question today is this: It says, um, other than investing regularly and allowing your assets to grow over a long time horizon, what advice would you give to young people trying to build wealth? So, so I would, you know, I, um, what I would say to a young person is, you know, and it comes right the way back to our uh, original conversation about um, the the the. the the, the magic of time, you know, you yeah. have time on your side as a, as a young person. You have time to benefit from the, uh, the, the historic outperformance of the stock market. You don't need to worry about the, the volatility. In fact, a bit of volatility is good because it gives you the opportunity to invest when the market is, is cheap. Yeah. So I think what I would say to a young person is don't be too risk averse. Yeah, this is exactly. the time in your life when actually you can take sensible risks yeah. um, and and go for it. By the time you get to my advanced <laughs> years, you're slightly more conscious of those of those risks. When you're 25, you don't need to be. Yeah, and for my part, I would just just add here that um, you know just because you're novice, as you say, don't be scared of that volatility. You, you, it, 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 it's, it's you're more able to take advantage mm. of it. Than it's your friend, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. and there's charts, and I urge people to, to seek out the investing principles work that we've done because it, this will be shown there. Where um, you know volatility and markets actually falling, even after you've invested your money, that's great if you have most of your contributing ahead of still you. to come. Yeah. Be- because that means you're going to be able to buy assets more cheaply, mm. and honestly, that is absolutely essential mm. um, to investing success in the long term, right? Yeah, absolutely right. You said it very well. Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, that is all the time that we have for now. All that remains is for me to point viewers to the various sources of help out there if you are interested in that. There is a steady stream of content and articles produced by Tom, me, and our team here, which you can sign up to at fidelity.co.uk slash expert. Tom and I feature most weeks on the Personal Investor Podcast, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts. And you can even drop in and speak directly to Fidelity team members at our London Investor Centre in the City of London, if you're nearby. With that, we'll bid you goodbye. Thanks for watching.